this is a classic. Um, um, I'm sure your companies don't take this view, but um, it has been heard. We have a very good static analysis tool. Apparently, it gives us 100% enforcement of our coding standard. Um, now, um, that, that kind of uh, naive approach has been um, quoted in terms of tools enforcing MISRA um, and um, is a very dangerous kind of um, myth that, that can circulate. Some of the things to bear in mind in terms of coding standard, complying with a coding standard like MISRA, First of all, we have cert a certain number of rules in the coding standard which are not statically enforceable. You cannot enforce certain rules in MISRA. Um, um, we, there are, I think in, in MISRA 2, there are probably um, half a dozen that are, that are in that category. They're, to they're, they're rules which um, are associated with things like documentation and, and so on. No tool can enforce that sort of rule. It's a process requirement, really, rather than a coding rule. So in, in some senses, there are, there are things which don't really belong in a set of coding rules. One, going back to our four coding standards again, um, I've already pointed out that they vary enormously in terms of the number of rules which they contain. But another aspect of this whole equation is the fact that um, they also vary in terms of the enforceability of those rules. I may be biased, but I, I, I do think one of the um, merits of Misra C is, is that it is, um, it is enforceable to quite a high degree. And that, that is actually very important. If you take a coding standard like CERT C, um, which, uh, as I've said, is a, is, is, is a very, um, very impressive document and contains a lot of very good stuff. One of the difficulties of that document is that um, probably 50% of the rules in it are not statically enforceable, uh, in this, or at least they're only partially enforceable. Um, in fact, they divide their rules into rules and guidelines on the basis of um, one of the criteria for making that division is the fact that um, they distinguish between rules which can be statically enforced and those which can't. But it is, a, it is quite a significant um, difference in approach. Um, not that the advice given in those rules is, is not very good. It, it is very good. Uh, it is simply that the problem is that they're so, sh they're so framed, a lot of that advice, that you can't actually guarantee that a tool will enforce it. Uh, of course, another interesting thing I, I feel about the CERT-C coding standard is that um, if you... Uh, people who um, have a copy of CERT-C, I think you would probably find that perhaps 1% had actually read the whole document. Um, of people who have miseracy, probably um, quite a high proportion will have read most of it. Um, so there is a balance to be had here. Um, but it also applies to some of these smaller coding standards, this, this thing, the, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory document, which, which has had a certain amount of exposure and, and publicity. Um, and and it, they are... There are 10 rules in that which are um, part of the, the process in, in, in NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, but looking at those, there are actually rules which are actually quite difficult to uh, enforce um, with a high degree of reliability, partly because of the framing of the rules and partly because uh, they, are, they are not well specified. So a rule that's statically enforceable um, has to focus on compliance as a property of the code. It's not to do with documentation. It's not to do with process issues. Um, 
A second aspect of in compliance with coding <laughs> rules is that some rules are not well specified. And by that, I mean rules such as these. Um, th these are rules, there's a rule in Misra, sections of code should not be commented out. Um, the problem with a rule like that is that it's very difficult to, to decide when um, uh, the contents of a comment are actually code and when they're not co a code. Um, so the whole basis of enforcement of that rule is slightly subjective and, and variable uh, in terms of the tool you use. Um, the principle that lies behind the, 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 um, the rule is, of course, a, a good principle. Um, the recommendation being that you should use the preprocessor to, to comment out with a hash if zero or something rather than using multi-line comments which can be, can be dangerous. But, um, but going to the NASA document, the power of 10, rule one, there's, there's a, uh, a rule with very good intent. Restrict all code to very simple control flow structures, constructs. Don't use go to statements, set jump or long jump constructs, and direct or indirect recursion. Now, the second part of that is very easy to enforce with a tool. The first part, restrict all code to very simple control flow struct constructs. Um, that is a bit more difficult to interpret. Um, exactly what that means is, is, is a little bit vague. Um, do you use a complexity metric to, to judge whether something's complex? I don't know. But that's the, that's the difficulty, I think, with a rule that is, that is loosely specified as that is, that the intent, the principle is good, enforcement becomes a problem. The third aspect uh, in terms of being sure of our state of compliance is that there are quite a lot of coding rules which are what we could describe as non-decidable. Um, in general, a coding rule can be decidable or non-decidable, undecidable. And a rule is only decidable if it's always theoretically possible to determine whether the code is compliant or non-compliant. And the problem is that uh, there are some things which are simply non not decidable in that sense. So here we have a decidable rule. Uh, the parameter identifies you, used in the definition and declaration of a function shall be identical. And the good thing about that rule is it's easy to enforce and there's no ambiguity about it. Um, a tool can still generate false positives and false negatives either because the tool doesn't do its job properly uh, or because the tool's got bugs in it or the tool has got crosstalk. Um, the tool is identifying something which doesn't correspond exactly to the rule or the rule is, has got crosstalk. Now, those, those are all difficulties with, with some rules um, that determining compliance is, is sometimes... Um, not black and white in the sense that different tools will give you different answers. Um, it's sometimes a question of how the rule is specified. Sometimes it's a question of how the tool chooses to enforce that, that rule. Often because the, the mapping of tool messages with rules is not exact, does not correspond exactly. Here we have an undecidable rule. The null pointer shall not be dereferenced. So th this is an example of undefined behaviour. Um, and it's possible to detect this in simple cases, but it's not something that can always be um, detected statically. Um, 
So a tool can uh, arrive at various conclusions. It can decide um, when it's looking at a pointer that the pointer will never be null. OK, we've passed. It could decide the pointer will always be null. We failed. We, <laughs> we violated the rule. It could also find uh, what we call an apparent anomaly, which means um, the pointer could be null if we go through a certain path. The question is whether we ever go through that path. And so we've either got a null pointer or we've got a path which is never executed. In other words, a redundant path, redundant code. So we've got a situation effectively there where we might have, where we could say we've either got a null pointer or we've got redundant code, but we don't actually know which. And then there's the situation where we can be completely unsure about whether the pointer can be null or not. Uh, if we have a pointer passed in from um, via a parameter, um, it might be possible through whole program analysis to determine whether that pointer is null or not. But in general, it often isn't, however good your tool is. So this is an example of, of, of a problem which is, which is undecidable. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's very true of, of certain bits of, of undefined behavior. Incidentally, going back to um, something that um, um, Randy brought up earlier on, in terms of faults, uh, I know um, Randy listed some statistics about um, 10 different faults and their frequency of occurrence. Um, the interesting thing about those 10 faults, I think it's about 10, was that actually only one of them was undefined behavior. The rest are things that um, that are problems, but they're not necessarily errors in the sense of, of, of language errors. They're things which are, I think you described as empirically defined uh, problems, um, uh, which is very much the subject of, of what coding standards are about. Coding standards exist to protect you against problems like that, which are... Um, things which are probably wrong, but they're actually, according to the language, absolutely, um, absolutely correct. They're not undefined, they're not constraint errors. The language is perfectly correct. So to me, this raises the whole question of can, how, how do you assess your compliance with a coding standard? How do you assess whether you are compliant with MISRA? And the answer is it's very difficult. <laughs> It really is, um, because tools don't always provide 100% enforcement anyway, even when a tool is statically enforceable, even when a rule is well specified, and even when a rule is decidable. So the tools are not perfect. Um, Misra's answer to that is that you need to have a compliance matrix you need to understand what your tool is able to enforce and what it's not able to enforce. And the other thing, which is a kind of very important aspect of, of measuring compliance, um, is to be aware of, of things like false positives, um, which we've also had a lot of discussion about this afternoon. Um, some rules are not well specified, some are not decidable, and some are not correctly enforced. Um, but, but the other aspect of, of, of the whole compliance scenario is that there, there are going to be occasions when uh, rules are violated deliberately and legitimately, and MISRA recognises that. Um, and so MISRA describes the, the necessity for having a deviation process. The problem with it, the whole deviation process is that it is very much um, an administrative nightmare. Um, managing deviations 
managing the whole business of um, the fact that tools are imperfect, managing the whole business that rules are not always well specified. Um, and again, that's something which um, very much needs tool support. Um, and um, fortunately, there are tools around that, that are contributing to that sort of thing. And um, although our, our discussions this afternoon are not supposed to be too commercially oriented, I would point you to the left-hand football on the screen over there, which will make a contribution to this sort of problem, uh, the whole business of managing deviations, which I think in terms of the whole business of complying with a coding standard um, has been a, a, a real problem, really, um, for many people.